Well, good morning. We've come to the final uh, panel <coughs> of this extraordinary conference here in Rome. I'm Catherine Marshall. I am also at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. And the topic we're focusing on here is on a structure, a part of the cultures of encounter, uh, which is interreligious dialogue. Uh, these range um, from very global to very, very local, even very personal when people have a discourse among themselves, uh, and from deep ideas to very pragmatic issues that are part of daily life. Uh, this discussion comes alongside what seems uh, a slew of other interreligious encounters uh, that even within the last weeks from Rihad to Doha to Baku, Los Angeles, Jakarta. But for our purposes here, uh, the interreligious is exemplified by a special document, which is a large part of the inspiration for our coming together, which is the document on human fraternity for world peace and living together uh, Pope Francis and the Sheikh uh, of Al-Azhar. Uh, I do also, though, want to highlight that we're talking about intra-religious dialogue and discourse within communities, uh, but also what is, in fact, my area of activity, which is engagement and discussion between the worlds of religion and non-religion or how does the uh, religious world have a voice in the global agendas of the United Nations, the G20, the G7, uh, etc.? So this human fraternity document highlights some of the points that are emerging as very central, the, that the problems as they shared the joys and sorrows and problems of our contemporary world. They focused on the problems of poverty, conflict, suffering of so many brothers and sisters in different parts of the world as a consequence of the arms race, social injustice, corruption, inequality, moral decline, terrorism, discrimination, extremism, and many other causes. I'm quoting from the document but as you'll see, it is a formidable list. But I also want to emphasize that it is in the name of the poor, the destitute, the marginalized, and those most in need whom God has commended us to help as a duty required of all persons, especially the wealthy and of means. In the name of orphans, widows, refugees, and those exiled from their homes and their countries, in the name of all victims of war, persecution, and injustice, in the name of the weak, those who live in fear, prisoners of war, and those tortured in any part of the world without distinction. So these, I think, in many ways, are the primary areas that the religious communities bring to the global agendas. So, for this discussion, we have a remarkably experienced and gifted panel. Uh, we have His Excellency Judge Mohammed Abdul Salam, who is the Secretary General of the Higher Committee on Human Fraternity. And he's also a member of the Executive Office of the Muslim Council of Elders and the former legislative and legal advisor to the Grand Imam of Al Azhar. Judge Abdel Salam works to facilitate interreligious dialogue and tolerance, and in 2019, he received a papal medal in recognition of his efforts. Monsignor Indunil uh, Kodithu Waku, I hope I got that right, currently serves as secretary of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, uh, and he was formerly the undersecretary there. He's a member of the clergy of the Diocese of Badulia, Sri Lanka, and he previously was professor at the Faculty of Missiology at the Pontifical Urban University in Rome. 
And last, but by no means least, is Ismat Jahan, who is a diplomat from Bangladesh, and she's currently the permanent observer of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in the European Union. She's a career diplomat, and she's previously held many positions as ambassador of Bangladesh to Belgium, Luxembourg, and the European Union, and ambassador and permanent representative of Bangladesh to the United Nations. So a wide range of experience. I'm going to turn first to Judge Abdel Salam. And for each, I'm hoping that the brief opening comments before we have a dialogue will highlight their personal experience, particularly with this extraordinary human fraternity document, uh, but also the broader challenging issues, the explosion of interreligious, intra-religious, et cetera, that we're seeing now. Judge Abdusalam. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I will be brief, to, so I won't take uh, much time in translation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jamia Georgetown and Majalat Al Hadara for organizing this meeting. I would like to thank the University of Georgetown and the uh, Journal of Civilization for co-hosting and organizing this important encounter. The truth is that the هذه الوثيقة الأولى من نوعها في تاريخ العلاقة بين المسلمين والمسيحيين هذه الوثيقة نستطيع أن نقول بوضوح أنها جاءت نتيجة لقاء In fact, I would like to say that the document on human fraternity, the first of its kind in the relationships between Muslims and Christians, we can say clearly it was born out of an encounter. Uh, كيف سيكون الحال اليوم أعتقد كنا جنبنا الإنسانية كثيرا من ويلات ومآسي الحروب التي عاشتها البشرية And I would like to say imagine if this encounter between His Holiness Pope Francis and His Eminence the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar Al-Tayyib would have happened in the, the 13th or the 14th centuries I think we would have saved humanity a lot of sufferings and pains واسمحوا لي أن أختصر قدر الإمكان كلمتي وأنا أقول لكم قصة بشكل سريع قصة وثيقة أو ولادة هذه الوثيقة التاريخية التي يتحدث عنها العالم شرقا وغربا كأهم محطة للحوار والعلاقات بين الأديان Allow me to tell you very briefly about the journey and the story of this historic document on human fraternity, which is now the center of the attention of the world in the East and West, and is considered a historic milestone in the interfaith dialogue. لقد غيّمت سحابة القطيعة وتجميد الحوار بين المؤسسة الإسلامية الأكبر في العالم والمؤسسة المسيحية الأكبر في العالم لما يقارب ست سنوات أو لأكثر من ست سنوات. حتى ولد أمل جديد من هذا اللقاء بين الرمزين الكبيرين في بيت القديسة مارثا في سانتا مارتا. Uh, the severed relationship and the frozen dialogue was a plaguing the uh, interfaith dialogue for more than six years between these great institutions, the Vatican and Al Azhar al Sharif, until this uh, document on human fraternity was born as a great source of inspiration and hope in the first encounter between these two great religious leaders in the house of Santa Marta. Uh, 
uh, at the Pope's, uh, Pope Francis' residence and house and on his uh, personal banquet, these two great religious leaders had the lunch together for the first time in our modern history. في هذه اللحظة تقاسم البابا والإمام قطعة خبز وتقاسموا الآلام والشعور بعذابات الإنسانية اللاجئين والمهجرين والمظلومين والفقراء حول العالم وفي هذه اللحظة من التفاهم والحب ولدت فكرة مشروع وثيقة الأخوة الإنسانية at that banquet, the Pope Francis and his uh, eminence, the Grand Imam, of, uh, Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, shared the piece of bread together. They also shared their uh, mutual pains and sufferings and their feeling of the disasters and the sufferings of the refugees, the migrants and the poor, the oppressed around the world. And they decided to take a joint action to alleviate the sufferings of those people. <laughs> لا أحد في العالم يعلم عن هذا الأمر يعملون بجد واجتهاد لصياغة هذه المبادئ التاريخية للإنسانية للمؤمنين بالأديان ولغير المؤمنين بالأديان. And so they decided and they worked together for almost one year on drafting these humanistic uh, principles in the document on human fraternity that addresses both believers and non-believers without no one in the world would know about their mutual and joint efforts. لقد ولدت بعد ذلك ولدت هذه الوثيقة من هذا اللقاء ثم ولد من الوثيقة وبسبب هذا اللقاء مشاريع كبرى لتحقيق الأخوة الإنسانية في أماكن مختلفة حول العالم. So, uh, from this encounter, the document on human fraternity was created, and from the document on human fraternity, a number of great projects and initiatives were launched to serve millions of peoples around the world. And from this encounter, the Higher Committee on Human Fraternity was also established. للخروج للنور من آثار هذا اللقاء. And also we are about to see in the light the project of the Abrahamic family house coming out from also this encounter. لدينا جائزة عالمية تدفع كل محب السلام والأخوة للعمل من أجل الأخوة الإنسانية قيمتها مليون دولار كل عام من هذا اللقاء. We have also an international award that is worth one million dollars to advance and encourage all lovers of peace and godness to work together for the sake of humanity. It was also born out of this encounter. ملايين الطلاب حول العالم في الأزهر والمدارس والجامعات الكاثوليكية وكثير من بلدان العالم في أماكن مختلفة يدرسون منهج وقيم هذه الوثيقة التاريخية نتيجة لهذا اللقاء. Also millions of students at Al-Azhar Al-Sharif educational institutions and also the schools of the Catholic churches around the world and thousands of students in different parts of the world are studying uh, the principles and the values outlined of, of, of the document and it was created and inspired from this historic encounter. <laughs> طبق وثيقة الأخوة كوثيقة رسمية في الدولة وطبقها في جميع مناهج الدراسة نتيجة لهذا اللقاء. I have just also returned from a trip to East Timor where the uh, elect president has taken his first presidential decree to adopt the document on human fraternity as a national declaration and to incorporate its values and principles in the national curricula at the schools and universities in his country. It was also born out of this and inspired out of this encounter. Pope Francis once said that the earth is our common home and that we all together have to join forces in protecting and defending this home. And I think this is a globalization of the challenges we are facing, so we can solve them together.
And the Grand Imam also mentioned during the pandemic of the COVID-19 that we need to globalize the culture of sharing food. And I'm here today present with you um, out of this historic encounter between the Pope and the Grand Imam. المجلس البابوي للحوار بين الأديان كاثرين كثير من الحاضرين الذين أعرفهم هنا عرفتهم إيرينا بوكوفا زملائي في لجنة الأخوة كثير منهم عرفتهم بسبب هذا اللقاء uh, Many of our friends whom I have come to know and be acquainted with like uh, Father Spadaro, uh, Dr. Tom, Dr. John, Dr. Catherine the uh, Pontifical Council for Interfaith Dialogue, my best friend Irina Bukova, and many others of our colleagues at the Higher Committee of Human Fraternity. I've come to know them as a result of this historic encounter between the Pope and the Grand Imam. <laughs> This historic encounter also inspired the Pope and the Grand Imam themselves. So Pope Francis in his uh, papal encyclical Fratelli Tutti said, the one who inspired him to write down this encyclical is his brother, the Grand Imam. صاغ منهجا جديدا في الأزهر الشريف لأول مرة عن الأخوة الإنسانية وثقافة التعايش قال أن الذي ألهمه في إعداد هذا المنهج هو أخيه البابا فرانسيس And also the grand imam of Al-Azhar, Professor Ahmed Tayyib when he drafted a new and a fresh curriculum for uh, living together in peace and harmonious coexistence he said that the one who inspired him to write down and develop this curriculum was Pope Francis, his brother أنا واثق أن القديس أغسطين و... وأئمة العالم الإسلامي مثل ابن رشد والغزالي وغيرهم فرحين الآن في قبورهم بسبب هذا اللقاء. I'm sure that Saint Augustine and the imams of the Islamic world like Imam Al-Ghazali and Averroes are they contented and happy in their graves now for this encounter. وأخيرا أعدكم أننا سنستمر في الكفاح من أجل تعزيز الأخوة الإنسانية وترويج هذه الوثيقة التاريخية بسبب هذا اللقاء وبقوة هذا اللقاء شكرا And I promise you that we will continue our struggle for promoting the values and principles of human fraternity in um, admiration and appreciation of this historic encounter Thank you very much Thank you so much for that personal witness and insights into the background, but also the path looking ahead for the human fraternity document. Uh, you've talked and focused very much on the personal encounter, the, uh, the leadership of the two individuals, but also some of the structures that can translate their inspiration into practice. So, Monsignor Indunil, you are also part of the effort uh, looking from the Vatican perspective. So perhaps you can give us uh, your understanding both of how we've reached this point and what it means looking ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine. This morning I met uh, Pope uh, Francis with a delegation from Mongolia. And then in his uh, speech, uh, Pope uh, spoke about culture of encounter. Uh, let me share with you. He said, the church is fully committed to foster a culture of encounter in imitation of her master and founder who commanded his disciples, love one another as I love you. So we are here to reflect on the document Human Fraternity. And from the, pontifical council, from the point of view of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue, I see it's, it's a, if the dialogue is a journey, this document is a milestone. 
<coughs> because with the council, the opening of the church, Ecclesia Suam, church must enter into dialogue with the world in which it lives. And also Pope says church has a message to share. And so it is a journey that we have been uh, promoting since the establishment of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue in 1964. And then uh, why this document is important for our time? Nostra etate in our time. It was a revolutionary document. And this document is also revolutionary because we used to hear that there is a clash of cultures. And religion is not part of the uh, solution, but part of the problem. And then if you analyze this document, we find, as you mentioned at the beginning, there is intra-religious dialogue, there is inter-religious dialogue, there is dialogue between religious and secular. Now, if we apply the traditional uh, Christian uh, spirituality of uh, three ways, we are purgativa, and then we are illuminativa, we are unitiva. We can apply and analyze this document and it's relevant to today's uh, world. If we apply, we are purgativa. That means first stage, let the light to come in so that we can see the dirt, trash in the world and act together to purge it. So accordingly, the document speaks of the evil in the society. For example, it forbids killing innocent human life, speaks in the name of the poor, the destitute, marginalized, orphans, widows, refugees, victims of wars, persecution and injustice, and the security, peace, and the possibility of living together uh, be becoming the uh, victim of the destruction, calamity, there's a list. So the world is sick. We see the dirt in the world, evil in the world. So the second stage is we are illuminativa. Second stage makes the, the sight possible with the light or the stage of enlightenment. Now there is light. Then we see, uh, uh, we see the dirt and then we analyze the causes. The document argues that the above all, above mentioned human sufferings exist as a consequence of the arm race, social injustice, corruption, inequality, moral decline, terrorism, discrimination, extremism, and many other causes. And it also analyze or mention about the uh, humanity has distance from religious values and has embraced individualism. So now we see the dirt, we see the causes, and then we are uni, uh, unitiva. The stage, state culminates in unity law on fraternity. The document does invite all persons who have faith in God and faith in humanity. So faith in God and faith in humanity to unite and work together to rehumanize the dehumanized world. Okay. Accordingly, it calls upon the leaders of the world, the architects of the international policy, the world economy, as well as intellectuals, philosophers, religious figures, artists, media professionals, men and women of culture in every part of the world to work to stop shedding the innocent blood and bring an end to the wars, conflicts, environmental decay, and moral and cultural decline.
So this document is a revolutionary document because it reveals human problems and ecological problems today and also reveals the causes and also proposes a way to remedy the prevailing situation. So in this way, I see this document answers to the need of our time. It is like Nostraitate in our time, this document responds and then uh, already we heard how it is being implemented and uh, it, uh, there are different initiatives, we can discuss it later. You very much highlighted the revolutionary, the uh, innovative nature uh, of this document, which for many is, is really a first. Another theme that comes out in the document is the uh, need for the East and the West, however we define them, to come together. And I think particularly there is a focus on Christianity and the Muslim world uh, as the central focus given their size and their enormous importance in the life of so many people in the world. Um, Ismat, you uh, serve as the uh, representative to the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, so you have a special witness, I think, to that part of the, of the uh, East-West challenge, such as they are. So what is your experience and what are your thoughts on the document, but also on where it will take us in the future? Thank you very much. Uh, since this is the first public opportunity, I have to thank the co-organizer of this uh, uh, event that we, the two-day event that uh, we are uh, present here. I'd like to thank the Georgetown University and the La Civileta Catolica for uh, organizing and hosting this, as well as uh, inviting me as uh, a representative of the YC. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, you have, uh, uh, you have raised an important um, question, or rather, you know, with regard to the East-West dimension of uh, human um, coexistence and how uh, fraternity can be uh, promoted. Mm, and I'd like to thank also Judge Muhammad Abdus Salam for setting the perspective uh, and the background of the Human Fraternity document and where it stands. And we are very happy to hear that some countries, such as Timor Leste, has uh, decided to incorporate it in this educational curriculum. These are very important because we speak, but unless our words are translated into action through specific project. It doesn't mean anything. So in the last uh, two days, we have been thinking how uh, to put words into action so that you know, it doesn't remain utopian. Um, I would like to also let, give a little background of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Maybe all of, many of you knew, know about it. It is not a religious institution, although the word Islamic might mean it's a religious institution. It's an intergovernmental body of 57 member states um, covering four continents, including um, in South America or, I mean, as well as uh, Europe, Albania in Europe. So, um, the promotion of interreligious and intercultural dialogue, and I should um, stress not only dialogue but collaboration, is a part of a treat, uh, part of the charter obligation of the organisation, and um, and it remains an integral integral part of the organisational organisation strategy to foster respect for diversity 
and peaceful coexistence and rejection of violence. These are the principles which are also embodied in the um, Human Fraternity document. Obviously, there are uh, many opportunities and scope for drawing in linkages between um, the OIC's own strategy as well as the Human Fraternity because basically, in the ultimate, we are talking about forging human solidarity in a, in a way where peaceful coexistence of humanity is promoted. Uh, I should, however, like to stress that uh, the real challenge lies in translating advocacy for peaceful coexistence into active uh, efforts at implementation. There is a big, it's a big challenge, you know. Advocacy is important, but how to implement through concrete action. In this context, let me also say how Pope Francis's um, idea of culture of uh, encounter is relevant. Uh, it is perceived to have a potentially strong and distinct appeal. I'm saying that, you know, since this concept is still, um, we, are we are discussing, it's emerging. So there is a potential and a good potential uh, in triggering openness of human minds or building human solidarity and mutual respect. What is important is the readiness to engage in that effort, in that journey, and uh, try to reach a mutually acceptable solution. We discussed it yesterday when we were talking about global governance. There has to be a willingness to engage and a willingness to, um, uh, I mean, you know, give up, I should say, I, I'm not finding the right word, but to willingness to, should I say, compromise or uh, to inch progress. One has to maybe, you know, give up a little to inch progress. So this is very important. But um, let me say that the role of geopolitics or um, in the, as well as the existing power imbalance in, in the global governance that we see had continues to remain. It had, in fact, never ceased. And then we find this strategic competition to excel over the other, quote unquote, the other. And um, in this context, um, when there is such competition, which may not always be very um, very useful. In, in this context, building trust and bridging gaps across religion and states is not an easy task. And um, this is why we would say that uh, uh, documents like the Human Fraternity, and uh, there are also has been and are attempts, I mean, you know, to forge um, solidarity across religion, across states. But uh, at the cost of repeating myself, I would say that uh, so far we have not really seen the real um, impact on ground. And uh, we believe that in order for interfaith dialogue, and I would insist on collaboration, which goes beyond dialogue, to have deeper impact, it must be structured and conducted in a manner so as to reach the grassroots of the society. Uh, here, role of education and starting from very early in one's life. Uh, I would say from, even from kindergarten level uh, and through responsible and targeted use of the media and the social media in particular, in the last panel, we have seen how important uh, digital technology is. I mean, you know, if you want to make, uh, take benefit from that. Um, and this must be an inclusive process. That means engaging all um, strata, 
of the society, namely the women and youth in relevant uh, discourse and decision making. I say that, uh, not to be misunderstood, but the role of women or the status of women almost, if I would say, in all the religion has been downplayed, if not totally ignored. So this is uh, such exclusion of a significant part of the population is not conducive in promoting social inclusivity. We have, uh, you know, discussed that yesterday in our group with you, Catherine, how important it is to have women's concerns uh, dovetailed into this. And um, the OIC has been um, part of network along with other religious leaders and peacemakers to create peace at the grassroots level. I, in areas of conflicts. I can give you some uh, example. It, the organization has undertaken some projects to support peacemaking and peace building. And uh, um, looking forward to lasting peace, uh, you have to have reconciliation and uh, justice. I think I heard one, somebody from the audience had spoken uh, earlier in the day today about the importance of justice in order to have lasting peace. The organization had undertaken some projects in, in this regard in southern Philippines, Myanmar, Central African Republic, Mali, and Nigeria, helping communities to use dialogues to foster reconciliation and cooperation. It has, uh, it has also made attempts through International Ulema Conference for Peace and Security in Afghanistan in 2018. We know the situation has changed remarkably in that country, but the OIC is uh, seized uh, with the, the situation in Afghanistan. And um, as uh, I had already noted, that with regard to uh, the um, human uh, fraternity document, the YC has so warmly welcomed uh, the historic uh, document, and um, we are we remain open to it, um, engaging more with the High Committee. And uh, I'm sure there would be more opportunities to do so because uh, I think since more or less we are talking and having same similar thoughts, it would be important to do more networking as the YC has been doing with KAISID based in Vienna with the Alliance of Civilization at the UN. And um, uh, on, on its own, the former YC Secretary General had a um, meeting with Pope Francis in 2018 in the Vatican and uh, has all, we emphasized on the importance of interfaith dialogue and collaboration for peaceful coexistence. A draft memorandum of understanding between the YC and the Vatican is currently under consideration. And uh, speaking of some of my own personal uh, experience in this regard as the OIC's um, ambassador based in Brussels to the European Union. I was instrumental in um, having that visit of the Secretary General to Vatican um, take place and um, also in the drafting of the MOU. But uh, as you know, it's not easy to just uh, sign an MU, it has to go to and fro. And uh, just uh, before I end, I'd also like to say that, you know, when we talk about uh, East and West, I think um, it reminds me of a poem from Rudyard Kipling in the British uh, time in um, colonial period in India. In fact, there is no east nor west. 
if together the human community decides to be one. But there are all perception of East and West, and also it's been said that twins would never meet. But I, I believe that you know it's important to reach out for the greater um, benefit of the human uh, community. And in that context, the YC has already signed an MOU with the European Union, and we are having regular senior officials meeting. The last one was in March, in, held in Jeddah. The next one would be in Brussels. And uh, we are constantly engaging with the European Parliament and the Council of Europe. Uh, in Strasbourg, and most recently the OIC and the United States has launched the strategic dialogue. I think it was last week, 23rd of May, and the Secretary General of the OIC had very fruitful engagement with the Secretary of State uh, Blinken. So these are ways of reaching out and um, trying to bridge the differences between the East and West, if I would say. And um, the issue of um, Islamophobia is a um, major concern of the OIC. And we believe that uh, the collective, um, sometimes, unfortunately, the, it's the collective perception of all Muslims as terrorists doesn't help because the few terror people, I should say, who take up terrorism are not really real proponent of Islam. So there has to be some kind of uh, ways of uh, removing that perception, and that is one of uh, my job at the uh, with in when I my discussions with the EU and the civil society is based in in uh, Brussels and in many parts of Europe also to show that how Muslims who are living here or else uh, where they are considered minorities are contributing to the host government, that should not be overlooked. So these are ways of uh, engagement. And from a very, very personal experience, I should say that um, there are um, quite misconception and misperception which leads to misunderstanding about the uh, role of women in Islam. I'm not speaking of other religion, that's for others to say, and uh, I have already mentioned that uh, across all religion, women's issues are downplayed. Or, uh, I believe that um, the YC is giving a lot of um, attention to that. The uh, Women's Development Organization based in Egypt, in Cairo, is uh, very much um, engaging. So I would say that these are also ways to show that uh, when you say East, I believe it's the southern uh, part, or which I, in my case I would say it is the Muslim world, to show that um, there is modernity and Islam, there is no conflict. So I, I believe, you know, it's very important to engage, and once again, I would say that engaging in such uh, discussions uh, like this today, which can be um, taken across to the, uh, broaden rather, to, uh, uh, I would hope for that, you know, uh, to broaden to uh, young people. It would be important. Sometimes I feel that we are preaching to the convert because most of us uh, here are already kind of, you know, they come with the openness of their mind and they have enlightened uh, views. But it would be important to engage, even if we could get, uh, get um, some students from across. Media people, I, I saw there, are, um, one, there is one gentleman from here, and others, so that, you know, our discourse can have more um, publicity and dissemination. Thank you, I think I've taken a lot of time. Huh? Thank you to all three of you. I, th I think we should move to audience 
um, or participant uh, uh, contributions, I have a host of, of different questions, but I do want to underline, first of all, the emphasis that you've put on uh, action uh, um, beyond the words and beyond the good will. Uh, I think your emphasis on education opens up a whole set of discussions. Uh, the issue uh, of how women are perceived within interreligious uh, and particularly the interreligious, non-religious engagement has, has enormous importance. It's certainly, whenever there's an all-male panel uh, in, in a meeting, you see an immediate response on social media that, that it simply means that we're not in the, um, the 21st century. So um, just as, as a, a final note, I come here from a meeting in Doha on uh, hate speech, quite a large, ambitious meeting by the intercultural issue there, and was very struck by the deep concerns about Islamophobia and the misunderstandings, the misrepresentations uh, that you um, are referring to, which became the centerpiece for the whole discussion on Islamophobia um, and hate speech. And just one final comment that I think is implicit in a number of the presentations here is this I the issues of justice and inequality which to my mind is one of the least cl clear themes in global discourse. It's an underlying theme even in Davos uh, that's been taking place this week. Uh, and it is an area I think where, because you talk about inclusivity, where we need to put a lot of attention. So I see one hand, uh, John Borelli, if we could go to him first and then Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the panel for uh, your remarks, uh, and especially good to see the interaction between um, the OIC and the Human Fraternity uh, High Commission. The Human Fraternity document, which um, Monsignor Indenu has called revolutionary and likened to Nostra Aetate, um, is uh, Judge Abdul Salam in his remarks calls a blueprint um, Cardinal Ayuso, who is the chair of the commission, uh, called it a model. And I, I, I want to ask specifically to Monsignor Indenul, you chose the purgative, illuminative, and unitive structure to analyze it. You talked today about a Mongolian delegation meeting the Pope. This is largely a Buddhist, tantric Buddhist delegation. So getting this model out of just the Abrahamic or the Christian Muslim into the larger interreligious arena, do you see this model based on meditative prayer, purgative, illuminative, unitive, as a way to open to the Dharmic traditions? And do you have some further remarks on that? Yeah, thank you, John, for the... Uh, no. Yeah. Thank you, John, for the remark and the question. Uh, yes, uh, this document, as I mentioned, even though it has been signed by Pope Francis, leader of uh, Catholic Church, and um, Iman of al uh, Sunni Muslims, when it was uh, signed, there were over 700 uh, leaders from uh, different religions and also those who ha have no religion. So uh, above all, this document is not a doctrinal uh, document. It doesn't uh, speak of uh, uh, it is inspired by uh, uh, personal experience, encounter of God uh, from different uh, religions, but it doesn't talk about a doctrine. 
And then, uh, how can we apply it to uh, a dharmic religion? Uh, so, uh, yesterday I received the Buddhist delegation and then I presented them like Fratelli Tutti speaks about uh, Good Samaritan. Uh, and then uh, Buddhist, there is a parable. One disciple came and asked Buddha um, uh, with all metaphysical questions, God, uh, angels, uh, ultimate life. Then Buddha said, if you are going through a forest, somebody shoot at you with a poisonous arrow. If you don't remove it immediately, if you think, who sh sh uh, shot at me, his caste, his uh, uh, color and all, you will die of poison. So whether it is a good Samaritan parable, uh, wounded person, wounded humanity, or whether it is a Buddhist uh, parable, uh, the poison, uh, we have here a serious issue. Humanity is wounded, our planet is wounded. That is a common issue. And then uh, here, the document gives some guidelines. It analyzes and also proposes uh, collaboration. So it is up to, I think, each religion to implement it in their own context. So the, it would be better, I am also thinking, at the Asian level, there will be a delegation from Thailand uh, next month, about uh, 94 people. Already I spoke with this Buddhist delegation. How to uh, promote this document or to have a similar document or to discuss with them how to uh, apply it to Dharmic uh, religions, Buddhism, uh, uh, Jainism, and also Hinduism, etc. Gotcha. I see you took the microphone. Did you want to comment? Um, الحقيقة أن أغناني أخي المونسينيور عما كنت أود التأكيد عليه من أن هذه الوثيقة كما وصفها ثورية وأقول أنها مختلفة عن كل ما سبقها وتمثل محطة تاريخية لأنها تمثل خطابا تقدميا إصلاحيا تجديديا في خطابات قادة الأديان ورموز الأديان حيث خاطبت الجميع لم تخاطب المسلمين والمسيحيين فقط أو الكاثوليك فقط و... وارتفعت فوق جميع الاختلافات فهي وثيقة إنسانية بامتياز ولأول مرة يصدر هذا الخطاب المشترك عن أبرز قادة الأديان يخاطب المؤمنين بالأديان وحتى غير المؤمنين بالأديان ولذا قولا واحدا هي ليست وثيقة دينية عقدية وإنما هي وثيقة إنسانية منطلقة من أو مستلهمة من رسالة الأديان جميعا المشتركة وهي رسالة السلام والأخو I'd like to say that uh, Monsignor uh, Edonel has just spoken enough and, and said what I wanted to stress because uh, this document is really uh, revolutionary and it is different from all the preceding declarations and, and texts. It is a, a reformist, progressive, and renewal uh, discourse from the religious uh, symbols and figures. Um, the fact that it doesn't uh, only address Christians and Muslims is very important because it is a purely humanistic uh, document addresses addressing believers and non-believers alike. And it is for the first time in history that religious leaders agree on a discourse that addresses all humanity together. So it is simply a humanitarian document inspired by the common religious values and principles. And this is what makes difference. Uh, thank you very much. This is very important to uh, specify that this document is not solely um, focused on the uh, Muslims and the Catholics, but I would say that um, OIC 
in, I think it was 2018 again, had organized with the King Abdulaziz um, Institute based in uh, Vienna, um, seminar in Thailand, where also Buddhist and uh, Hindu scholars and policy makers and civil society members were invited. Because end of the day, we are talking about humanity, not a section of humanity. So it's very important that uh, um, I would also, without consulting Jeddah, I would say to the High Committee here, that there are opportunities where our organization, OIC, can collaborate with uh, the High Committee to um, also involve other uh, faith and religious groups and communities in the discourse in future. Together we can do that, I think. Excellent, I think we're identifying quite a few bridges. We're coming very close to the end of the public part of this discourse, so why don't we take a few questions? I see at least three hands. So let's start with you, and then you, and then at the back I saw a hand before. Shukran. وسيادة الترجم شكرا للسيدة كاترين على حسن إدارتها وكذلك لباقتها في بعض الإضافات النوعية في التعليق على المحاضرين والسؤال المطروح للسادة المحاضرين الثلاثة ما هو أثر اللقاء في مجال مجال الشباب يعني حسنا فعل المجلس الحكماء عندما قام شيخه الأكبر الإمام الطيب بتنزيل هذه الوثيقة وصارت تدرس في المناهج الابتدائية والثانوي فنريد ما موقف المؤتمر منظمة التعاون الإسلامي ثم كذلك لجنة الحوار البابوية ماذا فعلوا للشباب وكذلك نريد بعض الإضافات من القاضي محمد عبد السلام في هذا الموضوع وشكرا I would like to thank Catherine for her wonderful moderation of the session and her valuable comments that really illuminates a lot of, of aspects of, uh, of the conversation. My question is, what is the impact of the encounter in the sphere of youth and young people and how to engage them? Uh, I think the Muslim Council of Elders has done very well when his chairman, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, decided to include the principles and the values of the document on human fraternity into the school curriculum in across all uh, stages of education, starting from the preparatory and elementary and secondary schools, etc. And the, what um, the perspective of the OIC and the Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue on how to implement this in, in, in different initiatives and joint efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Go there. I'm Philomena Mwaura from Kenya. I want to appreciate um, all the speakers and the insights they have uh, exposed us to concerning interfaith dialogue. My question is addressed to Ismat. Uh, you said that um, where, when there is dialogue and collaboration at the top level, and it does not impact the grassroots, that there may not be a lot of success. So my question is, uh, what do you think should be done to involve the grassroots and the different categories of people in the community? Great. Another important and difficult question. I think, did I see a hand in the back? Yes. Yeah. You're fine. Any, any other? Just to go along with what uh, was just mentioned, um, she spoke about uh, women, you know. I'm just wondering that along with the young people, I'm fully for it to engage young people in this whole process of bringing about 
some kind of change in the world today. Um, how can we involve women as well? Because uh, women also can play an important role, you know. And uh, Hismat had already mentioned a little bit about it. Could you elaborate a little more about how women can be involved and more engaged in this particular thing? Great. Well, Ismat, I think you're, you're on uh, stage right now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, these uh, questions are very close to my heart, by the way. Well, the first thing is how to involve um, people at the grassroots level in implementation of the documents for, as well as in general um, building solidarity and mutual respect uh, across uh, religion, across culture. And uh, I think, you know, uh, we need to, all of us think together, and it could be one of the projects that you are also involved in, uh, Catherine, in many of the projects. Um, it could start by uh, involving the community leaders at the grassroots level, the youth, the women, as well as the civil society there who are the advocates as well, you know, first we need to build the advocacy and then through projects. Through education, I have already mentioned, through the uh, targeted and um, respectful use of the media. The social media plays a very important part. So uh, engaging uh, the people at the grassroots level um, also in the decision-making process is important because in most of the countries, these are the municipal uh, community. They should be given a voice. And to the other question about uh, coming from Sister Evelyn, uh, did you mention how to engage women with only with regard to the climate change issues or all? Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, my answer would be barely repeating it because um, in many countries, uh, at the local level, there are also women leaders. They must be encouraged. There must be a pressure on the government to see that women are elected to this local council. And um, I've seen, um, I was also in the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDO, and there we had uh, um, general recommendation concerning how to include women in the climate change uh, policies and dialogues and decision. And um, I mean, you know, there has to be from, uh, coming from the civil society also to build up pressure on the government, respective government, that the women's voices are taken into account, not just uh, a cosmetic one, not putting women in uh, peace building commission and giving them a seat and not voice. That is not, women should be given voice, not symbolic one. I think uh, there are many ways of doing it. Many countries are doing it in uh, conflict and peace building. There is the UN resolution on 1325, as you know, peace and conflict women in peace and conflict. In Afghanistan, for example, there is a big uh, insistence that the women are included in the um, conflict resolution and the peace building. So um, I should say there has to be strong advocates and the women um, civil societies, the women groups can uh, encourage the women to come out of their home and take stage in their so social um, environs. Thank you. I can't resist adding just a comment that one of the issues we're concerned about is that in the broader discussion about women's engagement in the 21st century, the women who come with a religious inspiration are often invisible, sometimes through their own choice, but much more through the choice of the societies uh, in which they live. And another issue, in we've recently done a report in Bangladesh on violence against women during the COVID uh, era, and Many of the 
women leaders did not want to talk to the religious because the sense was that the religious were not interested or were part of the problem. So that's another bridge that needs to be forged. So it, we're very close to the end. So let me give each of you one minute uh, with, if you have any um, final comments or advice on where we should go next. So Judge Salam. لدي ملاحظتين سريعتين في خلال الدقيقة الأولى كما أنه لا أحد آمن في هذه الحياة وحده مثلما علمنا الكوفيد أنا أقول لا يمكن أبدا لأحد لمنظمة أو لمؤسسة أو لجامعة أو أن تقوم بتحقيق نتائج الأخوة الإنسانية وثقافة اللقاء وحدها لذا أدعو كل المؤسسات والمنظمات أن تتشارك معا لتحقيق هذه الأهداف بغض النظر من الذي يكون في الصورة أو من الذي يكون في العنوان لأن دعوة التشارك هي التي سوف تعزز ثقافة اللقاء الأمر الثاني كما ذكر الدكتور في سؤاله أقول أن الاهتمام بالشباب هو مهم للغاية علينا أن نتعاون جميعا لننقل هذه الرسالة التي دعا إليها البابا ثقافة اللقاء أو الأخوة الإنسانية التي دعا إليها البابا والإمام إلى أرض الواقع وهو ما نفعله أو نسعى لفعله بالفعل مع جامعة جورج تاون الموجودين هنا اليوم نحن نعمل عن بكثافة للتحضير لمشروعات تتعلق بالشباب مباشرة فشكرا جزيلا وشكرا لك كثرا على إضافة إدارة هذا اللقاء I have two uh, quick remarks. I will uh, relay them very quickly. Uh, as we have been told by the pandemic uh, that there is no one safe alone, I think also there is no organization, institution, uh, or university that can implement and actualize the principles of human fraternity and the culture of encounter alone. So cooperation is imperative, and we have to work together in order to translate the culture of encounter into real actions and tangible results. I would like also to, uh, in, in responding to the question raised by the professor, I would like to say that it's very important to empower and engage youth on, on, in our joint work and in our initiatives. And let's uh, translate the, con the culture of encounter, which has been called for by His Holiness, the, the Pope and the Grand Imam, into a reality through engaging young people and the different categories in our communities. Uh, and in this regard, I would like to uh, thank the University of Georgetown. We uh, have been working closely together to translate our talk into actions through the engagement and empowerment of young people. Thank you. Thank you. Monsignor. Yeah. Yesterday, a friend of mine came to office, and then uh, I edited a book on the document uh, 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 Christian witness uh, in a multi-religious world, recommendations for conduct. Then he was telling me that book was published to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the book. He was telling me he didn't know about the document after 10 years. So uh, we need to uh, promote this document at the grassroots level. And then uh, we, for us, the, for the Catholic Church, there is a network and we have to reach the uh, regional uh, uh, Catholic bishops' conferences and also national bishops' conferences and then, then local dioceses uh, to implement the content of the document, translate it into different uh, languages. And uh, thank you very much. You know, I can just endorse what uh, the two other panelists have said. And Judge uh, Abdul Salam, you have uh, summarized, and that's what I would also like to uh, just repeat that we need to collaborate, network. It's very important. And um, also engage the youth. We have been talking about it. I see one young man in, I mean, so that's only one young man. But I'm sure in future there will be more in a structured way. Tom, it's your responsibility <laughs> to see how we can engage more young people, come and listen, and also to speak. 
and uh, promoting grassroots level engagement. Another thing, and to also have intercultural uh, events. That is the way of you know appreciating each other's culture and religion. Um, I've seen that when we have a iftar, we have a, we invite um, from other religious community, and especially um, similar like you know other religion have uh, festivities that they can do. And uh, just I would like to um, not take your time, but I'd like to say that you know. Um, in 2015, uh, you see there was a terrorist attack in Brussels, and uh, there was anti-Muslim sentiments. And uh, but this one, like you know, uh, was just uh, give me one second. It's so important. I I won't play the whole thing because we don't have the time. Uh -huh. Just one second. Yeah, no, just uh, one second, if you could kindly hold. I, I, will, I will not uh, talk about it, but just remind. Uh, this is about uh, Ava Maria and uh, the Azan together, which was really a big success um, um, in Belgium at that time. The Lebanese um, embassy had done it. I would strongly implore I'm using the word implore, that uh, just uh, I won't play the whole thing. How interfaith collaboration can bring people. This is the Azan. I'll play it just one minute. on YouTube and um, right in the context when the, there was a lot of you know emotional um, sentiments were ongoing this kind of cultural program really you know got uh, the Muslims and the Christian together Azan and Eva Maria thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you to all of you for your inspiration, but above all for your leadership, your practical leadership. Um, I want to end with one quick comment. Uh, another person we've lost recently is Madeleine Albright, who was one of our colleagues. And I remember her saying at uh, various conferences that, yes, we need moderates, but what we need are passionate moderates, uh, which I think we see here. And I'm also reminded that these problems are urgent. The poet said, ever at my back I hear time's winged chariot drawing near. So I think we need uh, passionate and impatient moderates uh, to work together on the cultures of encounter. So to conclude, we're coming to the end of this formal part of the meeting here. I think Father Spadaro we owe you a great debt of gratitude for your hospitality and for your leadership. Uh, Deborah, uh, we uh, appreciate your gracious welcome. Uh, the silent partners here, uh, Ruth Gopin and Mary Gordon, have done enormous uh, work on this. And I also have to... I would also uh, note the extraordinary work of the uh, people who've recorded this for posterity. Uh, and to Tom Banchoff, my colleague. And all
all of this distinguished group who on a Saturday have stuck with us through this panel. So thank you and bon appétit. Merci.